Good morning. Let's turn in God's word to Romans, please. Romans chapter three. Romans chapter three. Now we come today to consider the faithfulness of our Lord in his priesthood. And by and by we'll explain what that means. But you can't really understand the priesthood without the sacrifice. As the book of Hebrews tells us, a priest has to have something to offer. And in the Bible, the Lord Jesus, in actual fact, is both the sacrifice and the high priest. Now that's something that in the Old Testament system couldn't happen. The sacrifice was an animal and the high priest was a person. But when we come to their fulfillment in the New Testament, the Lord Jesus actually is both. And as I said yesterday, there's a logic to the flow of what we're doing here that we thought of the faithful creator, the one who's made all things and upholds all things, and that he has done this in demonstration of his goodness and his glory, and that he continues to take care of us even after sin has come into the world and brought radical changes to the world. Now, one of the difficulties people have with the concept, I think, of priesthood, because we don't ordinarily think about priests in our day, daily approach, is that people around where I live, at least, assume that they have every right to come into the presence of God. Like, why wouldn't God want them to approach Him? Why can't they just pray to God whenever they feel like it for whatever they want? They have every right to. And that's because we have a definite man-centered worldview, a self-centered worldview, to be honest. I mean, I didn't get up this morning thinking, I wonder if Brother Eric is going to get enough breakfast today. It didn't cross my mind. Now, now that I look at him, I say, well, good, he doesn't look like he's about to faint and fall out of the chair. He must have made his way to some biscuits and gravy or some eggs or something to sustain him. But that wasn't my first thought. In fact, it wasn't my 32nd thought. Probably the first 30, minimally, were about myself. My three favorite people, as one of uh, the old rap songs that was popular when I was in high school used to say, are me, myself, and I. Okay? And I'm not going to beatbox for you or anything this morning. Uh, before we come to grief in these illustrations, let's read some scripture first and then we'll explain. Romans chapter 3 and verse 20. We'll back up and start at verse 19, actually. Romans 3 and verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. That's legal kind of language. In other words, it's not asking the question, are we as human beings guilty or not? He's already given us a barrage of Bible quotations earlier in the chapter from the Old Testament saying there's none good, no, not one. There's none righteous and so forth. So we know that we are guilty. But what God is interested in, because he is a just God, is that when the world eventually stands before God at the great white throne, what is going to be manifestly clear is that God is right... And human beings, whenever they departed from Him, whenever they turned to their own way, whenever they rebelled or sinned, as we would call it, that they were in the wrong. God's right, we're wrong. And the whole world is going to have to acknowledge that. Every mouth is going to be stopped. No excuses, no counterclaims, no extenuating circumstances. Man, apart from God, is declared guilty. Jew or Gentile, everybody. Verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Now, last night, Brother Bob did us a great service by explaining the conscience in a very helpful way. And I was feeling sad, actually, yesterday morning that I ran out of time because I wanted to get into Romans 2 in the conscience. And the Lord takes care of those things. That's the beauty of having multiple gifts in the body of Christ. It doesn't all rely on one man. You know, and the Lord put it on his heart to share last night what we needed to fill in. Because chapter 1 tells us that when mankind departs from a faithful creator, when they turn from God, there's not some kind of good plan B. See, people always assume 
Well, there are different truths, right? And if I turn from Jesus, I can find truth over here in Islam or truth in New Age philosophy or truth in atheism or whatever it may be. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that when you turn from God, you know what you're going to be turned to? 2 Timothy 4 says it this way. You'll be turned to fables. So if you want to believe a bunch of rubbish... Turn away from God, because the Lord Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, in John 14, 6. He's the only game in town. His Holy Spirit that He's given us is called, also in that upper room ministry of John, the Spirit of Truth. So if you turn from the one who is the truth, and if you turn from the Spirit of Truth, you know what you're left with? You're left with the Spirit of Error. You're left with falsehood. Now, Romans 1 tells that tale because we as human beings are created with that knowledge that there's a creator. We read it yesterday. Not only that we can see the evidence of a creator by the creation, we do see that, but it says God has revealed it in them. In other words, inside of us, we know intuitively that we are made, that we're not here by accident. And as Brother Bob so helpfully shared last night, God hardwires us for morality. We have that intuitive sense of right and wrong that the anthropologists will tell you. You can go right around the world and you never find a culture of human beings that is without standards. They all have some kind of civilization. They all have certain rules, certain taboos, certain things that are good, certain things that are bad. And some of these things are universal around the world. That's because God has put that in them. Now, not only are we hardwired for morality, we are hardwired to worship. So, if we don't worship the true and living God, we are going to worship something. And Romans 1 tells us that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. In other words, what did people start worshiping when they said, hey, I don't want to worship Yahweh or Jehovah, the Lord, the God of Israel, uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Bible, in other words. When they said, we don't want to worship Him anymore, what did they start worshiping? Well, they started worshiping man. They started worshiping human beings. So humanism isn't all that modern, you know. It's a very old notion to deify beings. Now, some cultures do that more explicitly than others. Some cultures elevate heroes and make up great legends about them. So you can look at the Greco-Roman pantheon, for example, and you hear about Zeus or Apollo or Hermes or whomever it may be. And when you read the Iliad and the Odyssey and these old classical works, you know what you find out about their gods? They're a lot like people, right? Their gods get ticked off. And when Zeus gets ticked off, he does something I've often wanted to do, at least in traffic. He hurls lightning bolts at people. Oh, so surprise, surprise, the God you've manufactured is a lot like you, except with superpowers. Isn't it interesting? Some of the most profitable entertainment things today are about superheroes. Comic books, graphic novels, video games that make as much or more money than movies. And by the way, all the top movies are about the Avengers and the League of Justice and Superman and Batman and Spider-Man and all these different superpowered beings, right? And what is the draw there? Well, the draw is that Peter Parker is just like us. He's got to go to school. He's got to deal with bullies. You know, he's got to do his homework. And oh yeah, he's got to go out and fight the Green Goblin and Dr. Octopus and people like that every once in a while and save the world. But then he's got to be back on Monday at school again. Well, maybe now he'd be quarantined. I don't know. It might you sort of simplify his superhero life. But people like that because they say, Oh, here's a hero, but like me, he's flawed. In other words, he's he's bigger than I am in certain ways. He's more powerful than I am in certain ways. But I can relate to him because like me, he's not perfect. And, And actually, he doesn't have many standards. You know, he doesn't really hold me to any kind of standard. Now, those are the kind of gods people like. A god that is manageable. 
A.W. Tozer pointed out that idolatry is not just making an image of wood or stone or gold or silver. Idolatry is any alteration of who God truly is. It's any false concept of the true and living God. So we have a lot of people in Christendom, in countries where people would say, oh, I'm a Christian. And yet their concept of God is idolatrous. Because their God is a God who tolerates sin. Their God is a God who's kind of like Santa Claus up in heaven, you know? That when we need something, He's always there to give it to us. We can pray and ask Him for it. But the rest of the year, He doesn't bother us. Isn't that nice about old Santa? You only have to think about Him in December, and then He goes away after He gives you the nice stuff. And to a lot of people, that's how God is. When I get into trouble, I go to God. (laughs) Or if they're more religious, yes, I go to church regularly. And maybe if I do this enough, God will be on my side and he'll help me out here and there. And oh, of course, when I die, he would never send anyone to hell because he's a God of love. Now, that's an idolatrous concept of God. That's a falsehood. Except it didn't stop there. Romans 1 said that after they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man, they went on down the chain, so to speak. It wasn't evolution. It was devolution. They went down... And they started worshipping four-footed animals. And they started worshipping all kinds of beasts and creeping things, such as my mother-in-law encountered last evening. Don't want to encounter certain creeping things, okay? She can tell you the story. See, I've opened up any number of conversations for you, Sue, so she won't be lonely today. But you go to Egypt, or you can go to any major museum, in the United States or any European capital pretty well. And Egypt was such a wealthy society that the British Museum and the Louvre and the Museum in Berlin and the Met in New York and I've seen stuff in St. Louis on exhibit at least and other cities as well. They have collections of stuff from Egypt. And what you find out is in Egypt they worship thousands of gods. Cows and snakes and alligators and amalgams of birds and people and all kinds of of strange things. And the interesting thing is that Romans 1 tells us is that as human civilization descended into this explicit and ever lowering uh, kind of idolatry, that what happened was a corresponding descent in man's moral behavior. So human beings who start worshiping false gods become like what they worship. It's sort of like junk food. Do you remember the saying, you are what you eat? Sometimes I've pictured myself like a slice of pizza with feet. Uh, Yes, it's daunting, isn't it? A preacher shouldn't meddle this way and talk about junk food when some of it is so delicious and so nice and so comforting at camp when you're swatting away a mosquito or something and you say, oh, a Twix would make it feel better. Now you're all thinking about candy. Sorry about that. Anyway, you are what you eat, we said. What you put in is what eventually is going to be reflected in how you look and maybe even in how you act. And it's the same thing with idolatry. If you set your heart on a false god, guess what? That's something that the Old Testament, when talking about idols, would often call them vanities. Something that is futile because it's not real. You read Psalm 115 or Psalm 135, and the psalmist goes down through and talks about all the physical attributes that an idol has, ears and nose and mouth and eyes, but they don't do anything. They can't move, they can't speak, they can't breathe here, they can't walk, they can't move their hands. You have to carry your idol around. You have to do for it, it won't do for you. And in the end, you find out it's powerless to liberate you from the chains of sin. It's powerless to free you from the guilt of sin, from knowing that you have to account before the true God for it one day. There's no answer out there in any world religion, in any philosophy, in any worldview that tells you you can have peace with God and know you have forgiveness of sins. You can have a right standing with God and be sure of your place in heaven. The only belief system that will tell you that is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you could name your religion, and whatever the end in view is, whether it's heaven or paradise or moksha or nirvana or whatever it is, you can't know 
that you've ever really gotten it. You can't know that you've ever really done enough, right? And so the behavior, since this God isn't real, it can't change my heart. It can't make me not covet things. It can't make me lust after uh, people. It can't make me seek after pleasure as an end in itself. And so there's no power in my life to restrain all of the evil appetites I have. Now, it doesn't mean that we are as bad as we possibly can be. Because again, we go back to what Brother Bob taught on last night. We still have that conscience. And it takes a while for us to fully corrupt. And the Bible uses that term that Brother Bob referred to, to sear that conscience, to burn it where it's calloused and unfeeling, where we don't know right and wrong. You can get to that place, but it takes some time. You listen to people like Jeffrey Dahmer, the late serial killer, who, by the way, professed to get saved late in his life. His dad most certainly was a born-again Christian and a prominent creation scientist. Uh, Unfortunately, Dahmer rejected the God of his father, went off his own way, and went into all kinds of horrible debauchery, which culminated in becoming a serial killer. But when he was in prison, he actually made a very clear profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I think he went on... MSNBC or one of those channels. I've seen it on the internet, although they keep taking it down. I wonder why that is. But uh, I think he was talking to Brian Williams or one of those journalists and gave his testimony very clearly. So that was very interesting. But as he talked about how he descended into becoming a serial killer, it wasn't like from the start he knew or thought, oh, killing is no big deal. No, he knew the life he was living and the things he was engaging in were bad. And yet he just kept doing it and kept saying no and kept immersing himself in it till he didn't feel anything anymore about it. And so he could go on and do increasingly horrible things. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? That as jaded, as um, sinful, as depraved as people can become, they still have certain things that they just totally can't efface. I mean, even Al Capone loved his mother, you know? He loved his family. It's interesting that some of these gangsters that have been responsible literally for thousands of people being killed were great family people, loved their children, loved their grandchildren. You'd see him in the neighborhood. You'd think, this is a good guy. And he wasn't presiding over horrible things. That's because even though we get perverted and we go into different kinds of sins, we're not necessarily as bad as we possibly could be. But one thing's for sure. If we're worshiping a false god, there's no power to change us. There's no power to save us from sin. And so there's this descent into every kind of perversion, every kind of sin, and you get that very ugly list in Romans 1. And then somebody says, well, what about the moral person? Not everybody's like that. Some people are pursuing philosophy. Some people are pursuing religion. And they're very noble people. And eventually Romans 2 comes to talk about the Jew and the law. And basically the argument of Romans 2 is, well, God is fair. And if you keep the law, then God will accept you. But the problem is, Romans 3 tells us that none of us can keep the law. That we've all broken the law. Uh, our late friend, uh, Brother Steve Holsheiser, Brother Bob was talking about him with me yesterday. He was a man who encouraged both of us in our walk with the Lord. He used to say the law is like a thermometer. The law shows you you're sick, but it doesn't make you well. I know it's an awkward thing to talk about this year at camp, but none of us wants to hear about a thermometer and being sick, right? But, you know, you can imagine if you heard that I wasn't feeling well, and you came over to my cabin there, and you knocked on the door, and you came in, and there was I in my pajamas, you know, with the uh, fuzzy sheep on them and all that. And I was sitting in bed, and I'm sitting like this with a thermometer in my mouth. And you say, oh, Keith, do you think you have a fever? No, no, I know I have a fever. First of all, thermometer, see, I have the old school thermometer, okay? Not the kind you just put on your forehead. I'm always afraid that thing will go off. You know, the old kind that you had to actually put under your tongue for an interminable amount of time. This thing already says I have a fever. But I've got it in my mouth so that I get better. And you'd say, Keith, you can keep that thermometer in your mouth all week. That's not going to get rid of your fever. 
You've got to deal with the underlying cause. And that was the thing about the law. There was nothing wrong with the law. First Timothy 1 said it's holy and just and good. It's made for a righteous person. But Romans 3 tells us there's none righteous. That's none of us. We're all spiritually sick. So what we need is a Savior. We come back to that question of approaching God. Now people assume I can waltz right into the presence of God anytime I want and God will be glad to have me, right? Won't heaven be that much nicer because I'm there? And doesn't the sun shine a bit brighter because I'm on the face of the planet? Now we don't put it that... Oh, that brother shook his head. No, I, I feel so distraught. Anyway, you know, we don't vocalize it or articulate it that clearly sometimes. But we kind of think as human beings, at least people that don't know the Lord do, of course God wants to have me. Of course He'd welcome me into heaven. Of course uh, He's glad I'm on His team. When the Bible says, no, the thing about God is God's holy. Now, holiness, as we've heard before this week from various brothers, that's separation. It's not just separation from, as we heard, not just being separate from what is evil and sordid, not just separated from what will make you spiritually unclean. So yes, it's separation from the dirty, but it's also positively separation in righteousness. What is righteousness? Everything that accords with the character of God. Everything that God says is the right and the good and the perfect thing to have. God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. So He is the standard. Now, every sin that has ever been committed from Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve disobeyed the word of the Lord, on up to the present time. And there are probably thousands of different permutations of sin that we could talk about. Different categories and subcategories and different ways that people sin. But it all has this common thing. It is all rebellion against God. It is all high treason against God. Now, you know, we have some folks uh, down in Guantanamo Bay in Cuba that are kept in a naval prison by the federal government. And these folks uh, are down there because they're deemed to be too dangerous to have on United States soil. And sometimes it's controversial, but sometimes, you know, somebody gets released or gets sent back to whatever country they came from. Now I realize in human courts, mistakes can be made and the wrong person can be arrested and somebody could be unjustly accused of something. So I understand all that innocent till proven guilty. But let's just say for sake of argument that we know somebody has committed a tremendous, horrific terrorist act. That we know, for example, they were involved in the bombing on the World Trade Center in 1993, I believe it was, when they filled a van with ammonium nitrate and blew it up in one of the parking garages of the World Trade Center. Now, let us say that 20 years goes by, and this person is now older. You know, they start to have a gray hairs and whatnot, and start to look a bit like I am, a little long in the tooth, you know, you know a little past dated, uh, uh, past its due date, or whatever one would say, you know, uh, expiration date, that's the word I'm looking for, I've been around too many pregnant women lately, but anyway, uh, not, not our family, I'm just saying, uh, generally, here at camp, um, but in any case, and we say, well, you know, it's been 20 years, why don't we let this guy out? Well, would you be happy having a man who packed a van full of explosives and parked it in a building with the intention of bringing down that building and killing thousands and thousands of people? Would that make you happy? Would you say, sure, let them come and move into my neighborhood. I'll make a bunt cake. <laughs> now, you Midwesterners are very hospitable, welcoming, friendly, nice people, okay? But even you, I think your hospitality would be a little tested by that notion. Because you'd say, barring some kind of change in this man, some radical alteration, what he has done is not only a crime against humanity, but it's a very clear declaration against authority, against what he thinks about our country. 
that he wants to bring down the government. He wants to kill people. He represents uh, the enemy that wants to destroy America, whom they call the great Satan and so forth. So you say, unless something radical happens to change that person's heart, and psychology can't do that, folks. And there isn't a 12-step program in the world that can tra- change a terrorist to a person that's going to be loving his neighbor as himself in the way that he ought to. I'm not saying there can't be moral improvement among people. I'm not saying people can't train themselves to have better habits. But when it comes to lifelong sin and the root of evil that is in all of us, we can't reform ourselves. We can't improve ourselves. We need someone to change us. And what's more, we need someone to wipe the slate clean for what we've already done. You see, even if I decided today, at the age of 47, I'm not going to sin anymore. uh, If such a thing were possible, which it isn't. But if I decided in my own power, I'm turning over a new leaf and I'm going to be a good boy from now on. You know, what, what about the sins I committed for the first 46 years? You know, good for you. You're turning over a new leaf. But what about the past? We can't go back and undo it, can we? And there's no formula in the Bible or anywhere else for that matter that God would recognize and accept for removing one historical sin. There's no amount of good works we can do that can make up for the evil we've already done. I mean, you have this a lot in pop culture. I remember there was an old film with Jimmy Stewart and Mr. Potter, you're just a mean old man. No, it wasn't that one. And it was another one where he played this clown in the circus. And you find out that he's the guy in the circus that whenever there's a problem, he's always helping somebody and he's always the nicest guy. And eventually there's some accident in the big top and he rushes to help the injured person and saves their life. And you realize the reason is because he's a doctor, but he's hiding in the circus because he was involved in a murder early in his life. And sort of the, the, the gist of the film is, well, it's okay. You know, he did this bad thing. But look at how he's now devoted his life to doing good. That's great, but it doesn't bring the murdered person back, does it? doesn't restore them to their family. See, we can't undo the damage that sin has done, much less remove the guilt before a holy and righteous God, a God who hates sin. You know why God hates sin? Because He loves people. See, we can't, this is the great irony, we can't possibly love ourselves as much or as perfectly as the Lord loves us. If I may lay on you a little Whitney Houston theology, uh, she sang when I was young, about 1987 or so, Learning to love yourself is the greatest love of all. Well, with all due respect, you can look at that poor woman's life and the sadness of her life and eventually how she died due to drug abuse. And you can see that that love left her down. That loving herself wasn't really true love. That when we turn in our, on ourselves, that's how Martin Luther describes sin. He said it's a turning inward on oneself. When we become obsessed with self, then the more we think about ourselves, actually the less good it is for us, much less for the people around us. Because part and parcel of what love is, is sacrifice. It's giving. And the Lord Jesus said this, Greater love hath no man than that he would lay his life down for his friends. Now, how does God demonstrate his love for us? Romans 5, 8 says, For God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait to get what he wanted from us. And when we brought nothing to the table, when we had nothing to give, That is when the Lord gave Himself. Paul never got over it. Galatians 2.20, the second part of it, he'd say, The Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. For God so loved the world. What's the extent of this love? 
Well, that He gave His Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Romans 8 tells us, God who did not spare His Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not with Him freely give us all things? See, as the hymn said, and I think Brother Bob quoted it the other night, He giveth and giveth and giveth again. He quoted the line about when we've come to the end of our hoarded resources. Talking about the widow woman there in Zarephath. So a little review. We'll build on that. But God doesn't hoard what He has. He doesn't hold back. That's our native instinct. God says, I'll give. I'll lavish on you my grace. No wonder 2 Corinthians 9 ends saying, but thanks be to God for His indescribable gift. You see, we can write millions of songs about it and we'll never fully express it. We can write thousands or even millions of books about it and we'll never come to an end of talking about it. For all eternity, I'm convinced. If we say, what do you want to talk about today? We'll say, let's talk about the Lord. Let's talk about the Lamb. Let's talk about the One who gave Himself for us. Let's talk about the One who laid down His life. Because if we're going to come to God, we have to have this sin removed. Because sin is what perverts us. It's what mars us. It's what ultimately destroys us. Sin, when it hath conceived, says James, bringeth forth death. So if we're going to approach God, my sin has to be removed. That's why Christians say things like Spafford said, my sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought, is nailed to His cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. Taking that image from Colossians 2, where that bill of indebtedness, that indictment against us that says, you're a lawbreaker, you're a transgressor, you're guilty. You are condemned. And yet it's been nailed to the cross and taken out of the way. They've been blotted out. And the Lord says, your sins and iniquities I'll remember no more. At least if you come with the right sacrifice. Now, what is the right sacrifice? Well, we come back here to Romans 3 and we read verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So that's the problem. But here's the answer. Verse 24. Being justified freely by His grace. Now what is justification? Justification is being legally declared righteous in God's sight. It is not only a full pardon. But it is saying this is a positive righteous standing given to you. That when God looks at you, no matter what anybody else says... God sees you as just, as righteous in His sight. That's a tremendous thing, isn't it? Uh, Go with me, keep your finger here in Romans 3 a moment, but go just over to chapter 8 very quickly. Verse 31. Romans 8, 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall we not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Now, God's elect is a way of the Bible of saying God's people. That was the term he consistently associated with Israel in the Old Testament, and a term he associates with believers in Christ in the New. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies So do you want to walk into the courtroom and say, now you can't forgive and receive Keith. And God says, no, I can. I'm the judge. I've declared him righteous in my sight. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Now, spoiler alert. This is what they call in literature foreshadowing. But this brings us into the thought of the high priest, which we're going to talk about in just a few minutes. But right here, what he's saying is that it's the Lord himself who is the judge. And he says we're righteous. Why does he say we're righteous? Why does he say we can't be condemned? Because the Lord Jesus gave himself for us. Because the Lord Jesus was that right sacrifice. Now we go back to Romans 3. And we read about that sacrifice. 
Verse 24, Romans 3, 24. Being justified freely by his grace. By the way, grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. It's his unmerited favor. It is, as the old Sunday school acrostic has it, God's riches at Christ's expense. Okay, So when you think grace, think gift. Think what God gives, not what we earn. Not what we buy, not what we contribute toward, not what we help out with. This is according to his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now, what is redemption? Well, redemption is buying someone out of slavery or buying someone paying the price of their indebtedness or paying even in this case for their guilt of what they've done. The redemption. Now, how is there redemption in the Bible? Well, the Bible knows one way of redemption. That's by blood. And Ephesians 1, 7, speaking about the Lord Jesus says, In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins through his blood, according to the riches of his grace. So the redemption here has to do with the sacrifice that Christ offered, which was his own life. When he went to the cross and died, it wasn't just to show us how a good man can put up with evil people. It wasn't just a a martyr for a cause like Gandhi or Martin Luther King Jr. who died for what they believed in. Jesus died as a sacrifice to deal with the sin that was against us because God could not let that sin into heaven. He could not let it pass by. He could not sweep it under the rug. He could not say it doesn't matter because again, if God doesn't deal with sin, then he says people don't matter. He doesn't care about the people that have been murdered. He doesn't care about aborted babies. He doesn't care about sexual abuse. He doesn't care about people lying to one another. He doesn't care about broken marriages or wars or any other evil thing that man perpetrates against his fellow man or on himself. If God doesn't judge sin, he doesn't care about us. So you can't say God is love if God is also not a just God who judges sin. But the wonderful thing is he's justified us freely through his grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Verse 25 explains the Godward side of this, whom God set forth as a propitiation. As I recall, we sang a song with that word in it last night, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood. What's a propitiation? It's a sacrifice that lets God judge sin and show that he takes care of that and judges it completely, that he doesn't let it pass by. And yet, it also enables God then to come out in mercy toward the sinner. And this is the wonderful thing. This word propitiation, this particular one in the original language, there's a couple of them translated propitiation in our New Testament. But this one is used over in Hebrews 9 to talk about the mercy seat that was on top of the Ark of the Covenant. Now, you remember the Ark of the Covenant and the tabernacle? You say, yeah, Indiana Jones, great hat, bullwhip. No, 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 sorry. All kinds of fiction there. Because in that movie, they think the Ark is all about a weapon. That's not what the Bible primarily thinks of the Ark as. The Ark is pictured as the throne of God. Psalm 80, for instance, or Psalm 98 also, or we could say 1 Samuel 4, they all speak about the Lord who sits enthroned between the cherubim. The cherubim were these angelic type creatures that we first meet in Genesis 3, and they're carved on top of the lid of the mercy seat. And you know where, when Israel was camped in the wilderness and the desert, for example, they were all camped around God's t- tabernacle. In Hebrew, it's his dwelling place. And, and there was this pillar of cloud by day. And at night, it was a pillar of fire. It was saying, God's presence is right in the middle of your community. And where was it specifically? It was over that holy of holies, that cube. That was behind the veil that only one person in Israel, the high priest, went into once a year. On the Day of Atonement, you can read the details in Leviticus 16. The high priest went in, but not without blood. And there, on top of that ark, the mercy seat was where the glory of the Lord abode. Now, the priest couldn't see that glory without some kind of veil between. Even though he went behind the physical veil, he had to take a whole lot of incense in Because God dwells in light, which no man can approach to, 1 Timothy 1 says. 
We need something between us and Him or we would die. He's that holy. But the priest would go in. And what was his permission to go in? How could he approach God? It was by the blood of a slain animal. In this case, a goat. And he would sprinkle that blood on and before the mercy seat. I think it was seven times. And the picture there was saying that you can't come into God's presence unless the God-ordained priest brings the blood of the right sacrifice into the presence of God. Unless there's a life given to pay for sin, because the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23 says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Unless you approach by that blood, you can't come before God's throne, before His mercy seat, and be accepted. You remember Esther? Esther didn't want to go into the presence of the king. Why? Because there was a law in Medo-Persia, or Persia as it was by then, in Persia, that unless the king called for you, you didn't come. I've thought about imposing that with my children sometimes. But anyway, never mind. No, I always love to see them. But, uh, you know, the king would have to hold out the golden scepter to you. Not quite a scepter, but here you are. So Eric can approach, because I'm holding out the golden scepter. And if he didn't do that... The penalty was death. Because this was an absolute despot. This was someone who was virtually all powerful. He was subject to the law of the Medes and the Persians. But never mind, that's Daniel 6. But anyway, unless he told you you could come and approach him, you couldn't come. Now think of the God of the universe. How are we going to approach the God of the universe? How are we going to come as sinners? In our guilt, in our shame. Still in bondage to so many habits and so many bad thoughts. How are we going to approach God like that? You read about his description of Israel in Isaiah 1. He says, from the head to the foot, they're nothing but wounds and wheels and open sores. This is a person just filled with loathsome disease, like a leper. How are we going to approach God? And God says, you know where the mercy seat is? You know where the place is that you can approach me? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the mercy seat. He's the one who set forth as the propitiation. His death on the cross is what enables God to say, see, I've poured out my wrath on sin, but you, the sinner, can now be forgiven and cleansed. And the rest of Romans will talk about sanctification, the Lord making us like Himself. And actually, positionally, He already sees us that way. Ephesians says we're accepted in the Beloved One. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you can say with the hymn writer, so near, so very near to God, I cannot near be. For in the person of His Son, I am as near as He. So dear, so very dear to God, I cannot dear be. The love wherewith he loves his son, such is his love for me. See, on Wednesdays and Saturdays, when you don't feel so godly, when you go away from Turkey Hill, and you've spoken out of turn to someone and said something really unkind, or when you've had a really bad thought, and you're tempted to think, oh, probably God loves me a bit less now that I'm doing that. Well, don't get me wrong. God doesn't love sin any more when believers do it than when before we were converted. But... God has put in a way to deal with that. That 1 John tells us if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. The word is the idea of a lawyer. One who goes to court with us, called alongside to help us in our case. And he looks to our every need. And 1 John 2, after talking about that advocate, speaks about him being the propitiation for our sins. So the advocate can say, you know, this doesn't separate you from the love of God at all. This doesn't disenfranchise you in God's eyes. This doesn't remove you from His family. Because your standing rests in the blood of Christ. It rests in the sacrifice, the propitiation that He offered. And so you're in God's family. You're a child. And that relationship can never be severed. Now, just like when a child disobeys, the fellowship may have problems. We may have to see the child repent. And we may have to discipline the child before things can be back to normal, right? 
And in like manner, if we sin, uh, it says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. First John 1 John 1.9. The great picture of this is John 13. That the Lord bathes a believer all over once when we're saved. When you're born again, a lot of people when they first get saved, when they first receive Christ, then they sin and they say, oh, have I lost it? No, you can't lose that. That's a once for all washing. If you've really been saved, you're saved. But you can get your feet dirty. It's like when you go camping. You go to that bathhouse. You take your shower. You walk back to your tent. You look down. Oops, I stepped in a mud puddle. You know? What do you do? Do you go back and shower all over again? No. Get a little bucket or a wipe or whatever you do. And you wipe off your feet, right? The Lord got down and washed the disciples' feet. And what he wants for us, in fact, what he insists on, if we are his people, is that daily we come to him, maybe many times a day if need be, and let him wash our feet. And the Lord says he'll do that. Now, the Lord is not only our advocate, the Bible says he is our high priest. And just in shorthand, when you go back and read what the Bible says about priests in Israel, we could summarize their job in two main ways. They represented God to the people, and they represented the people to God. So when Exodus 28 talks about making their garments, it speaks about them going in, the high priest would have an ephod with these gems that would have the names of the tribes on them. And he would also have their names on his shoulders. And it would talk about him bearing their names before the Lord. So he's going in as the people's representative into the presence of God. The other thing he would do, of course, is he would come out and represent God to the people. One thing a priest did, like you even see Zacharias doing it in Luke 1, is they were supposed to come out and bless the people. Zacharias is in the temple burning incense, but he can't bless the people. Why? Because he hasn't believed God, and so God disciplines him. He shuts his mouth till John the Baptist, this promised miraculously given son is born. But normally the priests would come out and pronounce a blessing. Number six tells us that blessing, the Lord bless thee and keep thee, the Lord make his face shine upon thee and give thee peace and so forth. But think about the Lord Jesus now. He is our high priest. Now, is he able to represent us before God adequately? I ask the question reverently. Let's go to the book of Hebrews. And let's just dip in. This is an enormous subject, which we don't have time to go over in 10 minutes. But we're going to give you the the Reader's Digest version. So you have to go back and read the book of Hebrews, virtually the whole thing, to really get the the entire appreciation of what the Lord Jesus uh, has done for us and what kind of priest he is. Hebrews 10, verse 11 And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Now the Lord did something that an Old Testament priest never could do. You've heard the saying, a mother's work is never done. Surprised there wasn't a great chorus of feminine amens there. But anyway, uh, well, an Israelite priest's work was never done either. See, you'd no sooner get done offering for the sins of the nation, much less the priest had to go in and offer for his own sins first. But... Then you know what would happen? (laughs) Five minutes after that, the nation would start sinning again. And it was never like, oh, I've offered this bull, or I've offered this sheep, or I've offered this goat, or I've offered this turtle dove, and I'm good for life now. Because these animals had to continually be offered. And in fact, in Israel, every morning, Exodus instituted this, and the other books of the Pentateuch talk about its continuance, there was the continual burnt offering. A brother read about it in the Lord's Supper on Sunday, how they would always have uh, that animal that was burning morning and evening, 
and all the other sacrifices that would be offered throughout the day as people brought voluntary offerings to the Lord or as people realized they had sinned and needed to bring an offering to the Lord or if it was a holiday, the priest had to offer certain sacrifices again for himself and for the nation. It was all on that foundation of the daily sacrifice. So if you would go down there, it wouldn't matter if it was 3 a.m., and you looked at the altar, the brazen altar, the copper, some say, altar, that was in front of the tabernacle, you would always see something burning on it. There was always that sacrifice. And they kept having to offer those same sacrifices. Now Hebrews talks about the priest standing day after day offering those same sacrifices that can never take away sin. Now why is it that an animal sacrifice can't take away sin? Uh, let me ask you, you come from Missouri or Iowa or some other place. Let me ask you, do you have any notorious gangs of Holsteins that hold up banks? I mean, did, did you ever hear about Jesse the Moo Cow James? You know, this cow who wandered into the bank and said, Brrr, empty your cash drawer. Doesn't happen, does it? Because as Brother Bob mentioned last night, animals are amoral creatures. We have a lovely little dog named Princess at our home. But I know something about Princess. If I leave my breakfast unattended, Princess does not wait a millisecond. She doesn't say, now poor Keith, his life is so difficult and he has to put up with so many hardships that I know he needs a good breakfast in the morning. And so I'm not going to help myself to his eggs and sausage. Princess thinks no such thing. Princess is a bit like Captain Jack Sparrow. There's only one rule. Can a man do it or can't he? And she would round that off to a puppy. Can a dog do it or not? You know? Now animals are amoral. They have no sense of the righteousness of God and of sin and guilt. And after all, animals aren't the one that brought sin on this planet. By one man, sin entered the world, Romans 5.12 says, and death by sin. See, it's a human problem. Here's the extraordinary thing that Hebrews 2 says to us. Let's go back there. Hebrews 2, verse 14. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same. Now those are different Greek words. The word where it's translated in New King James, partake in of flesh and blood, that means it was their common lot. They didn't have a choice. You didn't ask to be born, did you? Here you are. Voila. Surprise, mom and dad, here I am. You know, that's how we come into the world. The Lord Jesus had a choice though, didn't he? He was the eternal son of God. He didn't have to become a man. But he decided to share in the same, different Greek word. He became a real man, absolutely. The Bible attests to that with one important difference. He was sin apart. In other words, nothing sinful, nothing unclean, nothing tainted, fallen, or broken about the Lord Jesus Christ. Why did he do that? It says that through death, he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Now the devil is called in Revelation 12, the accuser of our brethren. And you see him in action in Zechariah 3, when there was a high priest there, Joshua, the son of Josedek, uh, back in the time when they were coming back to the land from the captivity. And Joshua, in this vision that Zechariah sees, is clothed in dirty garments. Now the priest would never actually go into the tabernacle or later the temple clothed in dirty garments. He didn't approach God casually. Actually, the first day the priesthood was instituted, two of the priest's sons, Nadab and Abihu, were struck dead by the fire of the Lord. Read about that in Leviticus 10. So you didn't approach God casually. You approached Him in fine linen, picturing righteousness. You wouldn't come in dirty gardening clothes. And yet here's the high priest in filthy garments. And there's Satan. His name means the adversary. And he's standing at the right hand. And then it uses the verb that is the corresponding word to Satan. So the adversary is standing at the right hand. That's the place of the prosecutor to be adversarial. Satan wants to accuse, in other words. He's ready to point at the high priest and say, how dare you come into God's presence? And before he can say anything, he says, the Lord rebuke you. 
The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem, is this not a brand plucked from the fire? I love it when the Lord tells Satan to shut up. Because who shall condemn us? It is God that justifies. If Satan wants to say, you have no right to save that man, woman, boy, or girl. You have no right to receive them. God says, I have every right. Look at what my son paid for. He paid for their sin and their guilt. And he rose again to prove who he said he was and to show that the work was done. And now to take that same power of his resurrection and put it into their lives where it transforms them. Because Romans not only talks about being saved from the guilt of sin and the power of sin, but eventually the presence of sin as we're glorified and taken home to be like and with the Lord. Now that's great. The Lord enters into heaven on our behalf. And he offered one sacrifice forever and then he sat down because he doesn't need to offer any more. Doesn't matter how much sin there is in the world and how much there will be yet till the Lord comes. The Lord already dealt with it all at Calvary. And if you come under the good of that work, if you're in Christ, how do you get in Christ? Christ has to be in you. You say that explains a lot. Well, the Bible says to as many as received him. To them gave he the right to become the children of God. John 1, 12. You have to cry out to the Lord in faith and ask him to save you. And when he saves you, you're in Christ. And no matter what the devil says, the Lord can point to his death and resurrection. And the fact, Hebrews says, that he's ascended and entered into heaven as our forerunner. As he said in John 14, I go to prepare a place for you. And God has now made heaven a fit place for the redeemed to be with him forever and forever. And the Lord is there for us, absolutely maintaining our place. Now, the other thing I said was he represents God to the people. And I tell you, people need a lot of help. You know, there was this woman in the Bible called Hannah, 1 Samuel chapter 1. And she had a problem. She couldn't have a child. And in her culture, that was about the biggest fail that a married woman can have. If you couldn't have a child, there was probably something wrong with you spiritually. Because Deuteronomy said that barrenness was indicative of unspirituality. Now, it's not individual. Deuteronomy was talking about nationally. So you could have a godly woman, as Hannah was in fact, who's barren, not because she's done anything herself, but she's dwelling in a time and in a place where there's general spiritual barrenness. And the Lord is letting everybody know that through her barrenness. So again, it's the old thing that what I'm suffering isn't necessarily corresponding to some specific sin I've done. It may be God wanting to use something in my life to teach others and to bring others to himself. And that's how Hannah was. But she went up to the Lord's house at Shiloh, where the tabernacle was in those days, and she poured out her heart. She was in deep grief of soul, and she prayed to the Lord. She didn't pray out loud, she just moved her lips. And yet the Lord has no problem hearing silent women. He hears our hearts. The priest there, Eli, wasn't very good of a priest. He was sitting on a seat. Now that's, again, kind of an inauspicious beginning. When you think that the priest work was never done, I know he was old enough to be retired by 1 Samuel 1. But still, I think the Bible puts that in there to tell us something. And he said, how long are you going to be drunk? I mean, what are you doing up here plastered like this? You know, how dare you approach God like that? And he didn't understand that woman's need. Now, let me tell you what Hebrews 2 says about the Lord in Hebrews 4 as we close. And we really ought to expound on this more, but time is gone. Hebrews 2, sorry, I'm on the wrong page. Hebrews 2 and verse 18. Now, oh, let me back up, 17. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Now, when you approach God and you say, God, I've fallen again. I've done it again. I've said it again. I've thought it again. Is the Lord say, you scum. How dare you approach me? No. It says he's a merciful high priest. I understand your weakness. I remember your frame that you're dust. I know the temptations. I know the difficulties you have. I'm not excusing the sin, but you can come to me and you can find I will cover that with my work and I will wash your feet. He's also faithful. You never cry out to the Lord and get a busy signal. In fact, contrary wise, 
Hebrews 7.25 tells us he ever lives to make intercession for us. Now, it goes on to say here that, verse 18, For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to give aid to those who are tempted. And the people that were receiving this letter of Hebrews were persecuted people. And the Lord Jesus, above anyone, understands persecution, understands trial, understands tribulation, understands pressure and problems. And there's no circumstance you can go through that the Lord isn't compassionate and able to minister to you in it. Because not only is he experienced and well versed and has seen it all, he's also never failed. He's never sinned once. He never shall sin as God's impeccable son and our perfect high priest. Now look lastly at Hebrews 4, verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You know what you need in these times? These times of fear, these times of economic uncertainty, these times of confusion, these times of pain, times of illness. You need someone that you can go to and call out to them and say, strengthen me to meet this. Help me to stand. Give me wisdom to go through this trial. Does God do that? James 1, in the same context of trial, says, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally. He will freely give you wisdom. And it says he upbraids not. He never says, Keith, you're so stupid. Why are you asking me that question? No, he comes near and he strengthens us as the high priest. Like Melchizedek in Genesis 14, who came to Abram and strengthened him to meet the temptation before it came. The Lord Jesus comes to us and wants to strengthen us. And we can rely on him. We can go to him every day, go to his throne of grace in prayer. Not a throne of judgment for us, but a throne of grace. And say, Lord, I'm your child. Give me what I need today to get through this day. Help me to live for your glory. Help me to be a witness. Help me to do good unto others. Help me to be more like your son. May God help us to do that daily. Father, we're thankful for our faithful high priest whose priesthood is based on a perfect sacrifice that needs no repetition. We're thankful that we can say once for all, done is the work that saves once and forever done. Finish the righteousness which clothe the unrighteous one. We do rejoice this morning, Father. We thank Thee for this great salvation. We thank You for our faithful Savior, who's our faithful Creator, who's the re-creator, the one of new creation. And the one who has the high priest is praying us all the way home to heaven, if we know the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, Father, we know we can't have the benefits of salvation and the priesthood of Christ without coming and repenting and believing on the Lord Jesus. We have to confess what we are before these sinners who need that blood to cleanse us, need that life that was given for us. We need the one who rose again to raise us up to walk in newness of life. And so we pray that if there's anyone here like that, or hearing the recording later even, that they would turn to the Lord while he may be found and be saved. We pray it in the Lord Jesus' name. Amen.